Good morning, everybody. This is Joe. I'm sitting out here on my front porch, and last night I was sitting out here, and I was looking at this little patio rack, a little knick-knack shelf that we keep out here. It has just some miscellaneous little pretty things that my wife likes. And I was uh, looking at it thinking, hey, you know what, that would make kind of an interesting subject matter for uh, pinhole photography. And then I got to thinking, well, what kind of a camera would I be using to photograph that with? And I decided that I would start using this uh, multi-chambered pinhole camera that I call a grid camera. And so I'm going to work on this project today. Um, so it's early in the morning. I mean, not super early, but it's almost perfect light right now for it. I think by the time I get the camera set up and everything, I'm going to have direct, harsh sunlight on this thing. And I could try it or I could wait until later in the afternoon, closer to 2 o'clock or even 3 o'clock in the afternoon before this would be in the shade again. So I might have to shoot this in harsh sunlight this morning. We'll see what we do. But I'm going to try doing a multi-image grid cam shot of this little garden patio rack. So stay tuned. This is my nine chambered grid camera that I built some time back in the mid aughts uh, when I was heavily involved with the F295 pinhole discussion photography discussion forum and uh, it's uh, it sits on a platform that is made from black walnut with some brass hardware and a quarter twenty blind nut for a tripod mount and this basically these little brackets enable it to the camera to sit down on this platform like that. Uh, and it is a box that is made in two halves, of course. So there's cabinet latches, jewelry box clasps. And let me open the back here. So the lid, the back of the lid is lined with black felt for as a light baffle material. And uh, this is the multi-chamber pinhole camera. So it has nine chambers. There's a central rectangular chamber, and then there's four uh, more panoramic shaped chambers on the four corners, and then these two more squarish chambers on the sides. And uh, when I was first investigating this idea of grid cameras, I in my sketch journals, I drew up a bunch of different ideas for what would be the optimal uh, layout for these grids. And I kind of decided there is no one optimal layout. It all depends on what you want to do with it. But uh, this is the, the one that I came up with. Uh, the idea with this is if you wanted to document either a physical place or some object or some theme or an idea, you could do so by having a like a general layout image of the whole thing using the central chamber and then the four corner chambers would give you a sort of a panorama if it was for instance a geographical location you might be using the four cardinal directions looking away from the central part of the site using those four corners and then the little smaller rectangular uh, images would be maybe close-up details of you know objects or something, a little close-up detail in that particular setting that gives you an idea of, of more of the history of it or whatever. Uh, and of course, that analogy is really ideally suited more for documenting a geographical location, whereas our subject matter here is this little rack, and so we would probably be, want to be using it vertically like this, which is probably what I'll do have the rack, the overall view of it here, and then I've decided I'll probably do the corners uh, like that vertically and then these little smaller images will be more close-ups of the top and bottom part of it and that's probably what I'll do. Let's go around to the front though and show you this nine chambered pinhole camera. Um, so each of the pinholes on this camera is a electron microscope uh, aperture. I'm using these little pieces of copper pipe with copper pipe caps and there is a piece of felt in the bottom bottom of each cap and they just press on there 
and that's the shutter. Now, some of these are fairly loose, and they will fall off if you tilt the camera forward, so I try not to do that. I try to lay it on the back if I'm storing it or whatever, but that's, those are the apertures. They're glued in place, and um, the whole idea of this camera is you're going to be using one sheet of 8x10 eight, eight inch photo paper. You could also use sheet film, but I generally use photo paper. One sheet of 8x10 photo, photo paper goes in the camera, and you're going to make nine separate exposures. You would ideally like to get the exposures very consistent one to the other so that this collage of different images together are all the same density or pretty close to it so they match each other. And uh, because I'm using electron microscope apertures, I know the apertures themselves are very, very close to each other, probably better than what I could do by making nine apertures by hand. Now you might be able to see that I have some labels. This on the top of the camera it says bottom and on the bottom of the camera it says top. And this is to remind me that the image is being upside down in the camera. This is the top of the images and this is the bottom of the images. Now there's another label I have affixed to the back of the lid, on the top of the lid here, and that relates to my exposures. Now this X number, X equals 5.24, this was my exposure system when I was using my Gauss and Lunapro F meter, and I would be metering the scene using the exposure time for F128 on my meter, and by multiplying that by this that recommended exposure time by this number gives me the exposure time for F293, which is what these pinholes are. Well, I'm currently using a newer meter that whose maximum uh, highest aperture is F90, so I'm going to be using a different X number up, but I have the uh, F293 value right there for me to refer to for my meter. So let me go and uh, set up this camera with a tripod and see how it's going to work before I actually load the paper in it. Okay, so in order for me to uh, get the center image of the grid camera centered on this uh, rack, I'd like to have the pinhole, the center pinhole situated in the middle, which is about maybe 18, 18 to 19 inches above the deck here. The shortest that this standard tripod will go places the pinhole about 32 inches above the deck. So I'm going to have to come up with an alternative tripod system. Well, as is often the case with these things, I'm going to have to do a makeshift mount. And I'll show you why. The wooden bracket that I originally built for this uh, box was really intended for the box to be set horizontally, landscape orientation. What we want to do is orient the camera vertically. So it kind of sort of fits. There's a little bit of a gap down there, which I'm going to have to manage. Um, so I do have a tripod mount now for that. But in the way this is going to sit, this way, the bottom plate needs to be only about a foot off the ground. And I don't really have a tripod solution short enough. So instead of using a tripod, I'm just going to use a makeshift something to sit this on for the center shot and then I'm going to have to raise it a little bit for the two top ones and lower it for the bottom corner. So this is going to be a makeshift scenario. Now you can see on the light here I'm already getting some direct light on my forehead and so by the time I get this shot set up to ready to go I'm sure we're going to have direct sunlight on this. And if I pan the camera over you can already see right here. This is what we're going to be dealing with here in just a little bit. So it's going to be interesting. And uh, this is what I came up with. This is the carrying case to my Royal Quiet Deluxe. And it looks like uh, it's going to work as a platform at least for the center of the nine shots. I'm going to have to put something underneath it to raise it up for the top ones and then maybe set it down flat for the bottom ones. Okay, we're here in the dark room. Here's the camera. And I'm going to have to choose what paper to use in this camera. Now I have my choice of semi-matte finish grade 2 paper. I have some uh, multi-grade warm tone paper. And I have some grade 2 glossy paper. Now usually for paper negatives I'm going to use the grade 2 paper so I can control contrast. 
Um, oh, I also have Harman Direct Positive paper, but I think I'm going to use paper negatives. And the reason why in grade two, the reason why is I'm going to get more contrast control, especially if I'm going to be shooting in sharp, harsh, bright daylight with harsh shadows. I want to be able to control the contrast a little bit better. So between the two, the glossy is going to give me a slightly sharper picture, but when I go to photograph the paper negative and make a digital positive image, it's going to work better with the semi-matte paper because the uh, finish on this paper has less problems with glare when you're trying to re-photograph it. So I'm going to use the semi-matte grade 2 paper and I'm going to pre-flash the uh, paper with my pre-flash light source uh, for probably about uh, maybe eight seconds uh, is what I usually use. So I have to make sure that my switch box is set to the pre-flash position and I'll get everything set up here and get the paper pre-flashed and loaded in the camera. All right, so we are done with loading the camera with the paper pre-flashing it for seven or actually uh, eight seconds right there okay and it's ready to go so we're going to have to decide which is going to be the top and which is going to be the bottom and it's really it's going to be the left or right stickers that'll be either on the top or bottom since we're going to orient the camera like that and uh, a couple of these one or two of these pipe cap shutters does has does have a tendency to fall off so i'm going to make sure that i kind of carry this more like upright so for metering this exposure i'm going to be using my Siconic l308 and uh, i have the iso set to 12 already which is what my paper is going to be and i've taken a meter reading a reflective reading on the front of the or the middle of that rack and uh, I've ramped the f-stop all the way up to as high as it'll go which is f90.1 and at that f-stop you can see it's going to be 30 seconds recommended exposure time. However my uh, camera is actually quite a bit higher of a focal ratio than that. So the camera is f293 so what I want to go is 293 divided by my 90.1 equals, then I want to square that, and then I want to multiply it by the 30 seconds recommended exposure time. And it tells me that it's going to be about 317 seconds, which if you divide by 60, is going to be about 5 and a quarter minutes, so roughly 5 minutes and 15 seconds. I calculated five minutes and about 20 seconds, so I'm going to put that in my timer. And I think I got this composition lined up maybe a little bit further out like that. Make sure I have it lined up with the middle, maybe a little further back just to make sure I get the entire rack. All right. Uh, so this cap is tight, okay. Okay, there's my start of my exposure. Now the exposure is still going on. We're about at the four minute mark. Um, I should say one minute into it. And uh, the, there is some high clouds, some thin high clouds up there. And so the sun is over the wall of my courtyard, but it's kind of diffused light. So this is a good opportunity to take advantage of that and get this main shot done. Now I didn't use the holder on the bottom of the camera. I just thought it was another variable. So I have just the camera sitting on the typewriter case with a little bit of a cloth to help make it a little more stable of a platform. And we are down to 3 minutes 22 seconds. We are at about 2 minutes and 10 seconds. You can see now I'm starting to get more direct daylight through the trees. So it's going to be an interesting background, certainly, to the image. Hopefully it won't be too high a contrast. Okay, we're down to about 20 seconds, and so I'm going to make my way over here, take the cap, and uh, prepare myself to cap the pinhole at the zero second mark. Three, two, one, zero. 
All right. There we are. Well, that's the first of nine shots. Okay, let's talk about the proper orientation of this image. So, the way the camera is situated, the images are inverted, of course, in the back of the chamber, as is true with all cameras. And so, the bottom of the image is going to be up here, and the top of the image is going to be back here. And also, the images are reversed left to right. So, I want to capture next the upper left part of this scene with this brightly lit little birdhouse. And so I'm going to want to use, because it's the upper part, I'm going to use the lower part of the camera. And because it's on the left, I'm going to use the right hand side over here. So this pinhole back over here is going to be for this upper left part of the scene. I want this collage of images to be kind of like cubism. I want to unfold the whole thing. So I'm going to be shooting at an angle, getting more of the the frame of the rack looking out this way, kind of unfolding it to maybe get some of the shadow here. And my light meter reading on the bright part of the birdhouse reads uh, 8 seconds at f90.3, which translates to about 85 seconds on my uh, calculator. So we're going to do an 85 second exposure. Okay, we're down to 20 some seconds. Stay out of the light here. Three, two, one. Cap the lens. Now with a complicated pinhole camera set up like this, uh, you're going to want to keep track of your exposures and which of the nine chambers that you've exposed thus far. So I kind of have a little crude diagram of the scene of the little rack shelf. And then I have a picture of the camera. Uh, and this is the view of the camera looking from the back of the camera. If it was transparent, you could see the paper in it. And so I've exposed the middle portion for five minutes and 20 seconds approximately. And then what is the lower right uh, looking from the back of the camera is a minute 25. That was the 85 second exposure we just did. Uh, so now I want to do the upper right part of the image, which is going to be that little clear glass jar. That's going to be the lower left part of the camera down here. So again, with keeping with my theme of wanting to make this kind of a cubist type of explosion of the composition, I'm going to be shooting this from an angle looking outward toward the edge of the rack uh, using this lower pinhole here. And uh, yeah, my camera is shielding a little bit of the light from the, the image, but uh, that's just kind of necessary at this point. My light meter indicates about 15 seconds at f90.2, which translates to 15, 158 seconds with this camera's f ratio, which uh, divide by 60 is about two minutes, a little over two and a half minutes, so maybe two minutes, 35 seconds, roughly. So I have the exposure started. Um, I have the little cap right here on the the case, the typewriter case. This is all rather precarious because the case is rounded on the bottom. So it's sitting on a cushion of this ottoman and it's wobbly. And then the bottom of the camera, which is really the side of the camera, has the jewelry box clasp, so it's not really flat. And so I'm using that little white rag as a way to smooth out the surface. So it's all kind of wobbly. Luckily this morning there's not much wind. Okay, we're down to less than 15 seconds here. Three, two, one. The two top corners of the image are done. Okay, so for the lower left part of the image, I'm going to be looking outward toward the side of the rack there. And I'm using this little car seat that seems to work pretty good to keep the uh, pinhole, which is up here, uh, pretty much level with that. It's a little higher than I want, but it's not bad. It's going to be kind of looking more like around here. And uh, so using the reflected light reading, it's picking up the bright stucco wall behind it, and it recommended 8 seconds at f90. If I use incident reading, it recommends 30 seconds at f90. So I'm going to use 15 seconds at f90, which translates with this camera's focal ratio of f293. It translates to about 2 minutes and 40 seconds, which is about what I had with the other corner we just finished. So. 
two minutes and 40 seconds. This is the left side of the image, so it's gonna be the right pinhole over here. Okay, so we have about 10 seconds or less exposure on this corner right here. And I'm glad I gave it more exposure than what the bright light recommended because it looks like our sunlight did fade here behind the clouds. So this might be a little dark, but at least we got more exposure than what we normally would have if we just exposed for the light, the bright sunlight. So now I'm gonna tip this camera over and try to get this corner over here. Okay, so for that bottom right corner of the composition, it's dark back there, it's in the shade, and uh, so right now with the high clouds we have, the meter is recommending 60 seconds at f90.3, which calculates to 10 and a half minute exposure. 10 and a half minutes, okay, we'll set the 10, 30, 10 minutes, 30 seconds. All right, let's start it. Now you might be able to tell from the shadow, the light on my face, it's, we have kind of a high clouds, nice low contrast light. So definitely 10 minutes sounds about right for this part of the exposure back there, shaded behind the camera box. But this reminds me that this kind of photography is one of the most difficult pinhole photography techniques because you're having to operate without a trapeze net nine times. In other words, you're having to trust yourself, trust your experience, your metering, your judgment um, with nine different exposures with the objective of getting them all fairly close in density to one another because this is a unified uh, light sensitive medium. We're not going to be photoshopping individual quadrants in compensation for mistakes. No, this is one image composited together from nine separate pinhole chambers. So it all has to be very consistent and we're, we're trusting our process, trusting our experience, which is not always trustworthy. <laughs> There's always Murphy. Murphy is alive and well. But anyways, I'm rambling on here, but we're a little below eight minutes left. So as this exposure continues now, we're at about four minutes left. Uh, it reminds me that this exercise has been a great example for you guys to show you that tripods and mountings of, of for pinhole cameras can be very challenging especially when you have uh, very low to the ground positions uh, most tripods just aren't set up for that and if you have the kind of tripod that will splay the legs out wide to get the camera low to the ground you'll find Oftentimes with these wide angle pinhole cameras, the legs are going to be in the shot. So this comes down to the point of makeshift camera mounts, as I'm doing here with this child's car seat, or my little ottoman here that I'm sitting on, or my typewriter case. You just kind of use whatever you can find. Put that cap on there. There we go. Silence that alarm. So the four quadrants, the four quadrants have been exposed and the middle, and now we're left with the four little small uh, images on the upper and lower part. Okay, so we're going to be photographing the le upper left, which is the birdhouse, with the lower right of the two small center ones. And the meter recommended 30 seconds at f90 which translates to five and a half minutes. So let's clear that and go 5.30 and uh, let's start it. And yes, this is a precarious mass with a cushion, with a typewriter case, the rounded top of the typewriter case, and the camera sitting propped up on its jewelry box clasp with a rag underneath to try to stabilize it all with the intention of getting that camera at the right angle to shoot that little birdhouse with that pinhole cap right there. Two, one, zero, cap it like that. Okay, so I have now the case on its side and the camera up on top of it, the back of it propped up with a rag looking down upon the glass beads in the jar, rather precarious. We're going to be using this one right there. And the light meter suggests 
30 seconds at f90.8, which is roughly the same exposure as last time. I'm going to do five and a half minutes. Now, while we're waiting for this exposure, I wanted to point out to you, this is a common problem with large format pinhole box cameras where you're using them in close-up configurations. And the problem is the shadow of the box itself is often in the image. It becomes part of the problem, the compositional problem. You can see the wall behind the glass jar is fairly brightly, brightly lit by the filtered sunlight. But again, the shadow of our camera is in there and the camera is looking kind of down on it. And there it is. So for the bottom small two cells of this grid cam, which are going to be these right here, I'm going to open them up pretty much the same time. And I've pulled the camera back enough to where I'm going to get the entire uh, piece of pottery and some of the rack. And I'm just going to have two side-by-side -side images almost identical from right here. So I'm going to pull one cap and then five seconds later pull the other. And as far as my exposure goes, the meter recommends 15 seconds at f90.4, which is 2.62 minutes, which is roughly 2 minutes and 40 seconds, I'm going to call it. So I started the uh, right one first, and then five seconds later I pulled the left one. So because it's gotten suddenly much brighter, I'm going to <clears throat> go ahead and cap these both now and just shorten the exposure time. 46 seconds left. And oh yeah, when the light suddenly got brighter on this last set of exposures, I re-metered it and it was only 4 seconds instead of the 15, so that would have been uh, calculated to be like 42 second exposure total. So we went about 2 minutes, so it's probably going to be way overexposed anyways, but we'll see. So those last two images, we're going to call it about two minutes exposure time. This is one of the challenges with pinhole is when the light is changing mid-exposure. So it started out darker and then it slowly got brighter and brighter as you can see. And so uh, I truncated those exposures. So this is totally winging it. These might not come out and these might be overexposed for all I know. But anyway, so we have all our exposures done now. And now it comes down to processing the paper negative. Okay, let's talk about processing this 8x10 sheet of paper. One option I have is I could use my Jobo 4x5 paper tank with the 8x10 extension. This extension tube enables me to develop a 8x10 in this tank combination, but the thing with it is it's going to be blind developing. You're just going to have to go with what you think is the right time. Whereas with all these varied exposures that I'm having, was having to do nine different camera chambers in varying kinds of light, I want a little bit more control over the development process, and so I'm going to tray develop in my 8x10 drawers, so a developer, a water rinse, stop bath, another water rinse and fix, and then a holding bath. And what I'm going to do with this is I have a bottle of used paper developer I'm going to use, so it's going to be fairly weak. It'll take a little bit of time for it to develop. It'll be a controlled uh, development. If it looks like it's developing too fast, I can stick it into the water rinse and slow it down and then uh, wait a little bit and stick it back in the developer. Now keep in mind that I don't really have a good night vision uh, set up for my camera here. I'm not going to really be able to show this under red lights, so I'm just going to do it blind. Uh, well, I'm going to be seeing under the red lights, but you won't be able to see it. I'm going to pour in my used developer and I'm going to try to just go ahead and use all of it because I don't know how strong or weak it is, so give ourselves enough development agent, hopefully, to for this to work. This has been sitting in here for several months, oxidized. Yes, I know it sounds like it won't work at all, but uh, I think it will. Okay, stop bath is going to be from this little jug here. And uh, the stop bath is the least important of all this, because really, you just want to stop the developing process. You can do it simply by diluting it with water. And there's a little bit of acetic acid in the fixer, by the way. Now, I'm going to need a counterweight up here 
to keep the drawers from flipping forward when you open them. And so since I've emptied my acetic acid, that was my counterweight, I'm going to use that jug of selenium toner. So this is the fix. Here is my used fixer that I mixed up a month or so ago. And I have waters in the rinse tanks already. So it looks like we're ready to go. Okay. Get this out of the rinse. The holding tray into the final rinse tray. So let's take a look at our exposures here. So this is the rack itself and uh, in the middle. And uh, I got the feet nicely there, the deck, the dark deck, wooden deck of the porch. Um, some detail of the stucco wall and a little bit of the shadows up there. Then the corners back here. This one is the glass jar with the marbles in it. That's actually kind of nice. And look, we got the little birdhouse with the welcome. And you can see the light behind it. This is the shadow of the camera itself, this angle here. And then here on the lower part, we have a little bit of this middle pot and the shelf to the lower part. And then here we have the really white uh, birds, which are just about overexposed. There's a little bit of detail in them. And then below it, this, uh, this part of the pot. And then up here, so we have the birdhouse, a little overexposed. You can barely see welcome. Here is the glass jar with looking through it. The beads are on the bottom, a little bit of light reflecting off from the bright lit wall behind. And then the two pot, the two images of the same pot below, which I really like. Those came out really well. I should mention that during the developing, when I first put the print in the developer, after about 20 seconds, it started, the highlights started to show, those dense highlights started to come up pretty quickly. And so the rate at which the highlights begin to show gives you kind of an indication of how much exposure they got. So I was concerned that there would be too much exposure and it then the highlights would get too dense. So after about 30 to 45 seconds, I pulled the print and stuck it in the rinse here left it there for a minute with very little agitation. Then I pulled the print out, stuck it back in the developer just to re-wet it for like 10 seconds and stuck it back in the holding bath of water for another minute or so. I did that three times. So I, overall, the developing took like four and a half minutes, but most of it was sitting in the water. And you can tell the water has taken on a little bit of the coloration of the developer, the carryover. But the whole purpose of that was to slow down the rate of development of the highlights and give the shadows more of a chance to come up so that the contrast on the, between shadows and highlights isn't so, so severe. And uh, I think I uh, achieved that pretty well. I think we have some fairly decent uh, tonal range here. So I'm going to finish rinsing this. And then I'll try to uh, photograph it uh, with a camera and process the image into a positive in my raw development software on my computer. And we'll take a look and see what it looks like. I don't recall the exact date. I'll have to look in my uh, binder of old pinhole paper negatives. But I first conceived of this idea of the grid camera well over a decade ago, I'm certain. And this, this nine-chambered grid camera was my first attempt at it. And as evidenced by some of my sketch journals, I had a lot of different ideas. There's a plethora of different ways of doing a grid camera. You can have a lot of different kinds of grid. You can have an ordered grid with all the cells of the same shape and size, or you can vary then kind of what I did with this particular model. It was a fun project years ago, but I've never really done too much with this project a until today was one of the times when I decided, you know, I really need to go and take this grid camera and actually make something serious with it, a serious attempt at a still life. I was sitting out on the front porch yesterday evening when I was looking at that little shelf on the patio and decided, you know, this might be a good subject matter. And as evidenced by the results here, uh, the scan of the paper negative, I actually used my this very same Lumix G7 camera. I photographed it in RAW and then uh, processed the image in Silky Pix, the developer studio. 
overall the image I'm pretty satisfied with the the evenness of the exposures overall is pretty good I think the only glaring uh, overexposure are the top two small images that are definitely too bright but uh, everything else is pretty consistent and I really do like the tonal range that I was able to achieve in spite of the challenging exposure conditions and light and changing lighting conditions and also I like the way that I angled the camera on the on the four corner images kind of looking outward toward the edge of the wire rack so it kind of unfolds it somewhat like you might think of as a cubist kind of a collage and uh, and then I like the repetition of the bottom two images the pot and looking at the central main image you can see that it's an asymmetrical uh, decorative rack there's three shelves the upper two have a pair of objects on each one but the bottom shelf only has one central object so there is a little bit of an asymmetry to it but I think it worked out pretty well and I'm pretty satisfied with it and I think the uh, lesson here is when you're using these kind of grid cameras you really do have to understand how the images are reversed in the camera and how they are reversed on each cell as well in order to get the composition to come out right so things aren't upside down and in the wrong place and that was quite challenging um, my exposure method of metering the scene at a known ISO that I use for my paper and then using a formula to adjust the f-stop for between what the maximum f-stop on the meter is and what the pinhole camera actually is that method seems to work pretty consistently with paper negatives considering I don't need to apply any reciprocity failure to these longer exposures with paper negatives so again the exposures varied from uh, as short as two minutes upwards of ten and a half minutes it is important uh, if you want to do this to document your exposures with a little chart like this to help you orient not only the images and what part of the camera it corresponds to what part of the scene but also to document the exposures each one so you have a record of them but there it is a pinhole grid camera still life composition in a paper negative and I'm pretty happy with the results Hey, this is Joe Van Cleve, and if you have any other suggestions for pinhole photography or alternative photography kinds of videos, uh, leave the comments down below. Hope you enjoyed this, and until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.